All right. Well, we're here for another uh, Quarantine All Access with uh, Mr. Jeff Finelli. Jeff, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Nice to see you and your luscious uh, quarantine <laughs> hair. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I have uh, I have good COVID hair game going right now, I'd say. And, yeah, I'm not... Uh, I'm not getting haircuts. Let's put it that way. <laughs> or, well, I'm, yeah, I'm way letting the beard, the beard grow, so we're all just... <laughs> I'm stockpiling razors, so at least I can shave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was, it was well, again, thank you for, for, for chatting. I know it's been a while since we talked, so it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So last time we talked, I think it was around Pirates, uh, Dead Man, Tell No Tales. So oh. it's been quite a few years. Um, yeah. But to um, before we start, though, before we uh, get into it, I, I was for some reason the other day I was remembering. Does you remember our, our little uh, shared Lisa Loeb encounter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, I do remember that. Yeah, we were. So I brought my daughter to a, 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 a with my wife and daughter. We went to a Lisa Loeb concert. She was singing like children's music. Right. And she'd released some records. They're really good, by the way, if you have young kids. Um, so we went to this concert at, at McCabe's, I think, in Santa okay. Monica, which, is, which yeah. is like one of my favorite guitar shops, too. And so we're in the back room where there are these cool concerts. And I kind of look across the room and I'm like, <laughs> I think that's Kaya over there. If I remember yeah, right, yeah. I thought you would text yeah, or message yeah. something like on Facebook. Like, are you at a Lisa Loeb concert right now? You know? <laughs> I like looked up and I saw you and I was like, oh crap. I was like, and then afterwards, afterwards like, oh, do you have a do you have a child? I was like, no. Like, am I <laughs> No, I just came to hear the the kids' music. Yeah. yeah, well, you know what? It was it was great. That was yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I think I was I saw Lisa Loeb on like Instagram or something. It made me trigger that memory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, let's uh, jump into it. And so for anyone who maybe hasn't listened or watched our past interviews, um, give us a quick, you know, refresher of, you know, your background. Like, how did you get into in, into music? And a, and do you really kind of remember the point in your life where you decided this is going to be my career? Uh, yes. Let's see. Okay. So I was, I was a very late bloomer with music. So I didn't play. I mean, I had a couple of weeks of piano lessons when I was a kid. Didn't like it. It didn't stick. So I wasn't into that um then the first day of my sophomore year of high school i got you know i had found a guitar up in the attic and i was trying to glue the strings back together which doesn't work but i tried <laughs> and, uh, and my my mom saw me and she's like why don't we just get that thing restrung so we brought it to shop picked it up on, after school on the day of the first day of school my sophomore year in high school so I mean, the, you know, the short version of that is it means that by the time I went to college for music, I was a three year old musician. Right. So I was mm -hmm. you know, most of the people coming into the collegiate music experience were started at age three, started at age eight. You know, I knew plenty of people that were like, I don't remember learning how to play this instrument. They just always did. You know, like they don't have memories from before they could play. And I was this kid that just, you know, I got a guitar started a terrible ska band because i grew up in orange county that's what you do <laughs> and uh and then i think within like that like the first month of having a band i realized this actually isn't you know if this goes well let's say this goes really really well and all of a sudden we have like hit records and da -da -da -da. now i've got decades in front of me of playing the hits that i'm writing in my 20s and it's, I can't imagine myself at age 60 wanting to go out and play whatever song, you know. So so what else could I do if I wanted to be a musician and kind of change hats a little bit and not feel trapped by prior successes or failures and all that stuff? And I think you, you can sort of naturally see it leads into film music because the the joy of this type of writing is that every project is different you know from the one before it so like i do go from pirates straight into you know uh, probably a thriller and then a comedy and you know a, a, a kids animation and you know and you're changing hats all the time and even if you're in the same genre the movie's different so the style's going to be different and you know you that was 
that was the whole appeal to me. And I figured that out probably within, within uh, my junior year of high school, you know, I realized, Oh, that's, that's it. You know, that's, that's what I want to do. And then when I learned that there were places you could actually study it, I ended up uh, going to Berkeley college of music for their film scoring program. But bear in mind, you know, where I grew up in orange County, Westminster is a city. So it's not, uh, how to describe it it's an inland city it's not affluent it's not really um an environment where musicians are supported in the way that like if you grew up in new york you know um for instance so so i was a unicorn right and where i lived and there were no studios that i knew of there were i don't i didn't know a single professional musician so there wasn't like easy access to that type of mentoring. It was totally on my own. So the way that I saw that I could possibly get into it was first through getting an education. Um, and, and I also knew from a, you know, an older friend of mine who had gone to Berkeley for one semester that a big part of that experience, you know, in addition to the education is networking. And I thought, well, I can't network with anyone where I am you know the the friend of mine that had gone to Berkeley was not a professional musician at the time so it was like no one could help me right so I need to get to a place like I need to get to a place where there are people around that do this you know and and just immerse myself in that in that environment so that was how I ended up going to Berkeley Um, while I was there I thought well now now the next step is how do I get into films you know and obviously they get made in Hollywood so if I'm going to be out for the summers back to Orange County uh, with my family, then I can drive up to Los Angeles if I find a place to work, right? So I'm, I'm kind of like scheming, I guess, to get yeah, my toe yeah. door. And I sent out like some 40 or 50 resumes to studios in LA, anyone that had a, anything listed about composing. There used to be this, like a phone book for studios. And it was called Recording Industry Sourcebook. So I go, oh, here we go. They say film music. And then they got a letter saying, we'll work for free. You know, like, these yeah. just, it was back in those days where like, please let me in, right? And I got <laughs> one phone call back and it was from Hans's receptionist, Hans Zimmer's uh, studio. And he was writing The Lion King at the time. So, you know, he was, he was already Hans Zimmer, but, you know, The Lion King to me was the one that sort of blew him wide open. He had done, I think, um, Driving Miss Daisy and probably, probably Rain Man. Rain Man, of course. Yeah, yeah. right. And I mean, I knew who he was as a composer. Right, but, right, yeah. But it was, you know, when I was an intern there, it was one building. Now it's, I think, eight or nine. You know, it's obviously expanded, but it was one building. Hans was there. Uh, Mark Mancina was either there or about to be there and Harry Gregson Williams. And, you know, it was much more kind of, uh, I guess it was an in, more intimate group. Um, yeah. So I, I worked for him for that summer. And then I worked um, every summer and winter break when I bounced back and forth between Boston for college and back to LA. And then when I finished my schooling was 96, pretty much perfect timing. Within a few months, John Powell was moving in to score face off. He needed an assistant and I was able to get that job. And, and that was when right. I really got going, you know. Um, right. And then from there, it was, you know, it was John's assistant, which was really a technical job. I loaded his computers. I got, you know, and then uh, eventually he started giving me more musical tasks, which was great. And uh, I mean, you know, that was where you really start kind of learning. And then at probably 1999, Hans asked me to work on Hannibal as an arranger probably because he had heard from John that I was doing all right. And, you know, and that was the next stepping stone. And then from there, it's just little incremental steps, a lot of work with Hans and with um, a few with Harry and maybe one with Steve. And, and, uh, and then I started getting some solo projects and, you know, here we are, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just love, I love the, the, the trajectory. It's just, it's, everyone's is different everyone's is unique and it's just I think it's very interesting to hear how everyone kind of got their little break and use that as a platform to jump up and everything so but um so yeah let's jump into some projects because you've done a lot since last time we talked um 
Uh, last one, we didn't get to talk about the Ottoman uh, lieutenant, which I thought was a very in interesting project. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm half Turkish and everything. So talk about oh. working on working with, you know, my dad, my dad's side of the family is all Turkish. So um, okay. I'm, I'm interested, how did you approach this story, especially set in, you know, Turkey and everything and, and yeah. dealing with, you know, especially as a, you know, an American composer, you know, dealing with a different world and different musical sounds. So kind of, kind of talk about that process. Yeah. So what I thought was super interesting about the movie was, you know, the idea was an American woman goes to, um, basically run a hospital in the middle of a war right in a foreign right. country which is first off you, you have to be daring and you know to do something like that you also have to be extraordinarily compassionate about people that aren't yours you know what i mean like it's not it wasn't her heritage it was i i want to do what what's right and what what can help the world and she falls in love um with a, a soldier who is muslim and she's a christian and so to me i thought i think you know i I'm raised on the idea that uh, religious differences aren't enough to prevent two people who love each other from being together. So that mm -hmm. was something that I thought was uh, super compelling. And that for me was what made it interesting. So, you know, forget for a second, it's not really a religious movie and it's, it's not meant to be. It's really more of a, it's a love triangle set against the backdrop of a, of a war of it actually of a genocide. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, it makes it feel sort of classic. There's a, you know, like Dr. Zhivago comes to, you know, these kind of like these movies that are set in a period where they're telling these kind of stories, those are interesting to me. And then I thought, well, you know, how can I approach it musically without actually, I'm not trying to write religious music. I'm trying to write right. human music, right? It's because that's a right. human condition. You can fall in love with all, you know, anyone. And they, and it none of that should be really affected by borders or, you know what I mean? Like, so so that was where, where I started. And then I think just because it had a period feel, the the music, you know, I wanted to lean more towards a timeless sound as opposed to trendy. I, there's a few nods to the geography and the ethnicity of the music, but mostly it's um, acoustic instruments, orchestral instruments, uh, trying to tell that story, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so. glad you saw it, actually. You know, I thought it was yeah, interesting. Yeah, I know it's one of those smaller films that, you know, kind of yeah. clip under the radar sometimes, but I think it's interesting and and really great. And I think people should check it out for sure. And your score is fantastic. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, you also did uh, completely shifting to a different genre, of course, Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarfs. So. <laughs> Very different. <yeah. laughs> but Very this different. is the joy. This is the luck of my career. Right? Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> so talk right. about, uh, yeah, approaching kind of this fairy tale, a little bit of a comedy spoof type uh, world. Yeah. Uh, must have been, I think it must have been fun, a fun score to write. Oh. Absolutely. Yes. And it's super colorful. And, you know, and, and like that, that's the thing about animation. Like, you know, they, you know, no one sets out to make an animation that doesn't look bright and beautiful and colorful. So like you have, you already have this sort of compelling visual world that just, you know, sort of grabs you and pulls you into it. I mean, you know, it's, 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 um, it's easy to get excited by it, I guess I'd say. So, that one okay because it's doing like a fairy tale and it's like a sort of a upside down fairy tale a little bit um you know i have using some of the kind of like the big orchestral gestures but it also has like a lot of very interesting sort of stylistic detours you know like mm -hmm. actually that's one of the very few times that i I did write a ska cue for that, for that movie. <laughs> you know just like sneaking through the the town i'm just thinking about it you know, Mark Ronson said to me one time when I was playing guitars with them during um, we were writing a score for Mordecai, he's yeah. he's he stopped me from playing and he said, you can take the boy out of Orange County, but you can't take the Orange County out of the boy, you know, because I'm playing either some SoCal punk thing or some ska thing or whatever, you know, and I'm like, right, the, uh, you know, at some point you have to not be ashamed of your roots. And so there they are in, in red shoes and the seven doors. There is finally a, a ska guitar in one of my scores. Um, but <laughs> I digress. But it, it, the point of the, that score really was that it could make these big rapid shifts, you know, from a big orchestral 
action scene typically fueled by comedy um, into, you know, there were pop songs that were written that were dovetailed in and out. And I actually worked a little bit with the songwriters to kind of do that, which is also fun. And, um, you know, it, it makes it pretty eclectic and super fun to work on that stuff. So, and, and that yeah. one actually, I think finally got a U.S. streaming release during, during the pandemic actually so yeah because i think it was finished a few years ago wasn't it like maybe a while yes years ago. and they released it in um so it was a the production company was south korean so mm-hmm. they were they were all in seoul and so and they had a release throughout um asia in the theaters and also um it started to make its way to europe i think right before covid spain had a release and you know and then um once we all kind of got quarantined they shifted the release to a streaming release which so people could see it because i think you know it's it's a good movie and it's super fun and you know i think it's definitely informed by well let me put it this way i'm sure they heard my music on pirates and said you know this guy could do this because it there's a certain amount of irreverence about the way we treat the orchestra in a pirate movie that uh, you know um is, well, it's certainly different from how you treat the orchestra in the Ottoman Lieutenant, which is, you know, much right. more, you know, like steeped in tradition. This is more like it's a rock and roll orchestra, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, South Korea has such an amazing animation culture there, too. And it's Incredible. fantastic. And I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of our shows that we love here in the United States are all animated over in yeah. South Korea. So like, even if you watch <laughs> Simpsons, Family Guy, or even our stuff at Cartoon Network, a lot of our work is with the South Korean studio. So. They really right. know animation well. Yeah, they they do, and and they, I also like that that project had a lot of, um, I guess, I don't know, cross cultural. Uh, as- so obviously they hired an American composer. The actors mm-hmm. are English. The, uh, one of the character designers came up through Disney, and so you know, there's a lot of like the whole world of animation is such a beautiful thing because there's there's the very uh, collaborative spirit among animators they it's they don't seem ever to be at each other's throats it's more like they share ideas they share you know personnel move all over the place and it's really fascinating and kind of nice to see um, the difference there because sometimes you know it, it's it doesn't feel cutthroat it feels very supportive and you know they're all they're all rooting for each other so right. uh, anyway, yeah it's quite, quite nice to see so Absolutely. Um, and uh, another, another film you did that I really love was, of course, Christopher Robin, uh, that you uh, co-scored with John Bryan, kind of coming in to, to do some additional work, but kind of becoming a co-composer on the project. And that was such a touching and sentimental film, and you brought a lot of heart to it. And I thought your score somehow just really cracked the, the, the emotional core of everything. So much it. And it was yeah. such a, you know, it was, I think it's one of those interesting takes on, you know, property that we all know, Winnie the Pooh and kind of examining a different light and kind of giving it a more human life, live action side to it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Mark Forster who directed it would say, the, the phrase that he said to me that stuck was magical realism. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, like the, just that as a term was enough for me to, get mu- musical ideas you know it, yeah, it, it yeah, points yeah. towards something and you go well in, in a funny way magical realism you, you could almost describe all music that way because there, you know you, you have these moments as a composer when you because we're by ourselves a lot and you know it's it's three in the morning and you play two chords and I've, i really have had this happen where it strikes me as patently absurd that playing those two chords together makes me feel an emotion like like and then I really stop and I go like if I want if I were a scientist right and I step back and I said why does that happen I I have no answer for that I I do know that if I play D minor and B flat it feels heroic it feels emotional I know that if I play C major and D minor it doesn't feel emotional in the same way you know and certain two chords together or, or obviously the, the flow of a longer piece of music is much more than that. It's a whole other thing. And it doesn't make sense to me that it works, but it does work. So that to me is that's magical realism because all, all yeah. music is, 
sound waves hitting your ear you know like like it's it's easy to understand why a big loud drum makes you feel afraid because you have an instinctive reaction to you know that is a dangerous sounding sound a tree falls down you got to get out of the way it's dangerous you know a lion roars you're gonna get want to get out of the way so i understand those reactions but why does a couple of chords make you feel sadder than you did a minute ago i don't know you know it, i really don't and i actually don't want to know why it works because that might take you know when as soon as you pull the curtain back right you're you're right. You're, you're destroying some of the magic and you're left with realism and i'm tired of realism you know so yeah. so christopher robin just that phrase was enough for me to go yeah you know you can commit fully to a movie about a talking animated bear when you realize the magic of it not not the right. real you know it the forget real you know like this and so just the way mark is so good at this it, um it, the way he made the movie it it really pulls you in and you know you start to feel these characters and not just because you read the book when you were a kid it's his unique sort of presentation of it really does make you go wow i do want to reconnect with my childhood again and i i don't want to leave that so far behind which is really the the story of that of that movie um you know we all lose a little something as we grow up and now we've had the realest year uh, you know any of us can remember just now <laughs> won't it be nice yeah. to get back to some magic so so anyway i i'm i'm just sort of riffing a little bit about christopher robin but that was just a special project for me because yeah. you know, it was it was beautiful it did happen very quickly. Um, so there wasn't, you know, there wasn't time really to, to think it through. I had to do it all emotionally and, and kind of respond with my gut. And, um, you know, I, my normal process when there's a little more space in the schedule is to write something, you know, finish a whole bunch of it, watch it, think about it, tweak it, change it. You know, th that part of the process wasn't there anymore because we had to work so quickly. So it was all just like, well, I have to trust my gut right now and I have to write what I think this should be and, and just go, 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 go. And, and I did. And, um, you know, we, it probably affects the score in, 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 in material like that. It probably affects it in a good way because there, it's not analytical. It's not intellectual. It's really just like, this is a sort of an outpouring of emotion that affects hopefully the audience and you know i'm trying to just tell this this story um yeah that I, I mean i just think so fondly of that and i yeah it it was uh you know not not necessarily the way that i like collaborated with mark ronson on a score it's di a very different process but but we've found a way to tell this story which has a certain amount of melancholy in it without mm -hmm. it feeling you know well, actually, melancholy is maybe the wrong word. It's it sounds bigger than it than than it, you know. It, it's a joyous story set within you know right. a little bit of heartbreak. So there's a little somber tone to it, and yeah. And, and yeah, and, and and of course it was an interesting, uh, just a unique project because you, of course you came in last second. For anyone who doesn't know, it's part of the yeah. industry. Sometimes a composer who's working on it means music replaced, or they wanted to go with a different direction. So you didn't work directly with John, but you're very also respectful of the music that remained in the film too of his and and so that it was probably just a hard way to navigate but also yeah i think your gut reaction you're right it's just like you're reacting and it's just coming out of you and that's what it is so you're not overthinking yeah. it you're not doubting yourself you're not you know maybe going back and oh, let me try five different versions it's like no nope, this is the first thing that comes to mind right right right, right. and it doesn't mean yeah. necessarily that it goes straight in the movie obviously mark was very you know very in tune with what i was doing and and we worked intensely together to, to finish but you know the truth is i'm i'm also an enormous fan of john's music so mm -hmm. it was sort of yeah uh, you know I, I in a perfect world i would i would have i would love to have spent the the four months that i spent with mark ronson you know in a room together making music i think that would have been amazing and uh, you know that it's sort of I'd, I'd do that tomorrow. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> I do it after I get vaccinated tomorrow. Yeah, you know? after, but you know yeah. what I'm saying? But, but I'm saying like, you know, that was a different, it was a different way of doing it. But, but 
I, I think you're right to point out, and I'm glad that you felt that I respected his work because I do. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely came across. Um, and uh, so you, you got to, again, reunite with another director you worked with in the past. Let's, let's talk about reuniting with your Dead Men Tell No Tales director, yeah. Joachim Running on for Maleficent, uh, Mistress of Evil. And of course, another, uh, you do such a great job with these kind of fantasy scores. And I, I think it's just like part of your bread and butter. And, and um, Talk about working with Joachim and, and coming back and, and, of course, tackling a sequel that you didn't work on the first one. Out of. Right. So it must have been, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, with, with the Pirates, it was Pirates 5 was the first one I did with Joachim. And that when it was such an easy transition because, yeah. you know, I think even though I wasn't the composer on the first four movies, I was the additional music, you know, one of the part of the team. I always approach those jobs as though I were the composer anyway, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, I know full well, I'm not, it, it's Hans's movie, but it was, it's the, it's the way I have to do it so that I can commit to it. Cause otherwise I feel, I don't know. So, so moving from the, the first four pirates into the fifth was not that hard at all, I guess is a bit of right. a way to put it, you know, I felt, I felt ugh, totally ready. I I knew it was going to be a difficult job because anything at that scale is difficult, but I was, I knew how to do it. Maleficent, totally different. I wasn't involved in the first score. Um, I loved the first score, but yeah. you know, I, frankly, I had never written anything at all like the first Maleficent score. So, you know, if, if I wasn't already, you know, in a good relationship working wise with um, Yoakum, no one would have called me for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, there's no, yeah, you know, there yeah. are, so it was sort of like, I did sit down with him, with Joachim, before the movie was shot. And, you know, I said, look, well, first thing I said was, tell me about the movie. Like, what's what's new? What's different? What's, what's, what's how are you expanding on the story? I mean, you know, it, it's the open question. Why would you make a sequel if, you know, if there isn't something new to bring to it? So he talked about all of that. And that was instantly like, okay, so there's a whole new world that I can write, um, I guess, you know, new material. We're we're pushing the we're pushing the walls out. So he had, he talked to me about a, you know, a, a, the plight of the rest of the Fey, which is you know there are multiple Fey cultures which we learn about in um, in the movie, and they've all been basically outcast from the world of human, from the human world, and they're living inside of a basically inside of a mountain like they're refugees they're displaced you know and they're all collected in one place from multiple uh, let's say countries we were, we were saying biomes um so and maleficent learns that she's not the only one and that's a big revelation and so that was a whole new world and and i thought okay that that almost exists outside of the first score so that's that's a place where i get to be jeff but in the same way that I respect John's music for Christopher Robin, I respect James's music for Maleficent. And that means I have to learn this language. I have to learn how he used the tunes, when he used them, what they mean, you know, what I can do with them, when they should be changed and, you know, uh, manipulated in some way. And when, you know, fans of the franchise in just in the same way in a Pirates movie or a Star Wars movie or an Indiana Jones movie, there will be a moment where you want to hear the tune and just play it, you know, and forget yeah. for a second that it's not my music and I don't have to go and say, this is Jeff, you know, I can say this is Maleficent. Right. So that's, that was how I approached that one. And I also, I really, really like when there's continuity between uh, scores across multiple sequels, it doesn't always go that way, but my feeling on it was, you know, forget that my little ego wants to take credit for everything that you know gets done the right thing for this movie is to give the movie what it actually ought to be and there are moments when you know maleficent earns and should have the tune that she always had and there are other moments when she's doing something new that's different and she should have a new tune or you know and obviously aurora probably even more so has has a lot of character growth from the first movie she plays a much bigger role she's not passive anymore she's you know much more muscular and then you have michelle pfeiffer um ingress 
who is a whole new character, and then the Dark Fae, which is a whole new character. So, so that the approach on that sequel very different from Pirates, but you know, the first thing I did was I got the scores from the original, and I started going through them and going, okay, here's the instrumentation that he used, and I thought. Well, first off, it's the largest orchestra on the planet. So I'll just have that, you know, like there was nothing you could add to it. There's, you know, it was a humongous orchestra. And then, it goes big, yeah. yeah, it was big and choir. And the only place that really needed new um, instrumentation, I think, was with the um, with the dark fay culture that we learn about. And so that became like a place where I could go and, you know, bring in really the idea was that it's many ethnicities all at once you know mm -hmm. and not necessarily that they have a parallel to human ethnicity um but the way i could do it because the orchestra had basically been used to full extent already with james's score was to bring in elements some of them synthesized but some of them real instruments from around our world and use them in combinations that doesn't you don't point you to a specific ethnicity you know if i if i put a sitar and a tabla you think of india so i could but if i put a sitar and a dumbek and a chimbalam you're you know it's it's now it's a whole other thing so so right. it's much more of a you know i guess more colorful kind of kind of world for them and i also knew part of the story is the fey are allergic to metal so they can't uh, iron they can't touch iron so i didn't really want to use any instruments that had a metallic sound or that i mean you know you couldn't strum any instrument that has strings with metal in it you know what i mean so that yeah. instrument doesn't count you can't use it right you can you can play a nylon string guitar you can play hand percussion that's made with um you know i don't know drum heads that don't have metal <laughs> you know then i really was meticulous about that and so that sound i thought well there'd be no reason why the dark fay would want a metallic sound in their music that's they they're allergic to it <laughs> you know what i mean oh, so right. so that informed it and you know those these are you know composer concepts they're not things that need necessarily to translate to the audience but you know they just but they, they're they're there i mean it's the same thing how if a director will use colors and the lighting yeah. to you know it, and it's for those folks who are looking at the mise-en-scene and trying to examine it i think the sound palette is something uh, sound and sound. I don't know what you want to call that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but, but I know what you mean. Yeah, like one one thing I um, Hans told me this once. I think it was. Yeah, I think he was talking about Apocalypse Now. He says, "Put the, the DVD." This is how long ago he told me this. Put the DVD <laughs> in your machine and watch it on fast forward and just watch the 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 tone, the color tone as it goes by. So you you know, say make make the movie five minutes long and watch the movie get darker, lighter, darker. You know, what why and where does that happen? And you know, nothing in a movie is done by mistake. Like you're mm. saying, you know, those colors are there for a reason. And the same with the same with the music. And you know, it's not supposed to translate to to a person in the audience watching it and going, Oh, I heard a metal noise in the you know what I mean? Like that's not right, right. But you, I think there's still a um, kind of a, I don't know, subliminal intake. And it also means that the score is even more specific to the movie, which I'm, I'm a big, big, big advocate for specificity in film scores. I right. don't think you can take my Pirates music and put it in another movie or or the Pacific and put it in another World War II movie. You know, it's it's really for that thing. And Right, right. I, at least I try to do that. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think any any composer, you're, you're writing for the story that's in front of you. Right. Um, right. And uh, so speaking of kind of reconnecting with directors, um, you also got to reconnect with David Kep, which is yes. fantastic. You guys have such a great... Uh, uh, so you kind of went back into maybe thriller territory, not not, not yes. so much of the Mordecai... Uh, no, no. <laughs> slapstick romp. <laughs> no, right. But, but Mordecai, I mean, like... Oh, God. It was just so fun to write that. But his the thing with Dave, I realized while I was doing, you're talking about the movie You Should Have Left, which you was a thriller, left. Kevin Bacon yeah. and uh, yeah. Amanda Seyfried. And um, he wrote it. And I think David and I are similar. You know, when I talk earlier about getting to change styles a lot, you know, the first movie I did with him was Secret Window 15 years ago now, I think, or maybe. Right, even. yeah. So he's one of my oldest friends in, in, in Hollywood. 
or even though he's in New York, but you know what I mean? <laughs> in the business. Yeah. Um, and then we did uh, Ghost Town. Ghost Town, Ricky Gervais. Yeah. I feel like I'm forgetting one, but I, <laughs> there was Mordecai. And then this, so no, I think that's all. Yeah, and then, then you should have left. So, and they're all different. So yeah. like he, like me, wants to, you know, change hats, I guess you'd say, and yeah. kind of make something new and different. Um, his... So I sat down with him and Kevin, actually, Kevin Bacon, who was producing the movie um, before they shot it. And we just talked about ideas. And I mean, I and think he's a, he's a musician, too. Uh, he yeah. has a band with his brother, the Bacon Brothers. Right? Yeah, and they're great, actually. And, yeah. so, and it was interesting to, to talk with him because not all um, directors or filmmakers have, have that kind of background about in you know any specifics except how much of the um score do we want to kind of um you uh, i guess like utilize the geography you know because we're set in uh, wales um the, i mean most of the story they go to wales for for a um, vacation and then you know pertinently get trapped in the house you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sort of an interesting accident because obviously we started making the movie before the quarantine came and then when it did come they they it was released on streaming which i think is sort of cathartically right for a movie like yeah, that. yeah but we talked sure. about you know like how much should we try to involve welsh instruments um you know we weren't trying to write a welsh score if we were well they wouldn't have hired me and <laughs> i'm not that guy <laughs> so you know but but using the instrumentation so i did like like i went and got a there's an instrument called a cruth which is sort of like a i'm doing this this is how you hold it <laughs> it's um it's sort I'm of like not, a I'm, fiddle. Not, I'm not having a seizure I'm, I'm yeah, i don't i don't it. have it with me but yeah and you, you put it you know it's like a fiddle basically you put on it's like yeah. a lap fiddle, sort of like that um and then there's some other instruments that i use there's a there's a larger sort of older brother called a tackle harpa which is not specifically Welsh, but it is uh, in the same family of instruments and it's like the bass version. So I was using the two of those and then, um, but not to try to play a Welsh melody. It was more like, right. you know, what can I do? Because on, on scores like this and also the ones I do with Dion Taylor, I especially like creating, I, I, I guess you'd, like really specific unique sounds for the movie that are something that I just do on my own you know like I'm not mm -hmm. a crew player there are many fine you know ex world-class musicians who can play the instrument but what I can do is I can put a microphone up in my studio I can find a couple notes that I like that are you know inspirational and they start to generate musical ideas and then eventually you know, inevitably they become part of the score too. And so if you listen to that music, the movie opens or with um, me, uh, well, when they arrive in Wales, I should say, it, it, with me sort of struggling with that tagle harp, I, it, I can't play it. But what's super fascinating is you can hear the struggle in, in the, me trying to perform it, you know? So it adds like a layer of tension that actually wouldn't be there if someone could play the instrument because it will sound and feel easy and so now all of a sudden i've got a sound nobody else has because it's my hands my instrument my microphone you know and my three in the morning <laughs> and <laughs> and now i've got something unique specific for the movie that says you should have left and no one else can have it and it won't be in another movie of mine you know so this was part of the way that i like working on that type of movie you know I, the David Kep films are actually a good crash course when I talk about specificity, because if you go from Secret Window with its very, I would call, I mean, I was, I'll openly say very influenced by Bernard Herrmann because it felt yeah. like a Hitchcockian yeah. throwback thriller. And then you go to Ghost Town, which was a romantic comedy uh, of its time where, you know, the 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 pop music elements that get into the score are of its time as well. It, I mean, you know, it's it's Snow Patrol and John Mayer and all the, you know, those those are like, they're some of the songs are even used in the movie, but that production technique applies. And then I have the orchestra there, but it's playing in a very, um, how would I call it? A, playing in a style that's very sort of chamber group and generally 
cheerful, I guess you'd say, and comedic and that kind of thing. And then you go to the third movie I did, which was Mordecai. That, that's the one I did with Mark Ronson as a co-write where, I mean, it's a heist movie. It's got a 60s throwback and Mark's sort of retro sound and pervades it. And we did all the band stuff with the Dap Kings in New York and the horn section from the Roots and like, and like it's all legit. And then the score side of it is more along the lines of pink panthers you know what i mean like this kind yeah. of thing we're, we're in this sort of zone and all this stuff that meshes together a, a third and totally different score and then you get to you should have left it and it's literally me with the microphone by myself with a candle going <laughs> on a cello abusing you know whatever instruments around that can give me the sound so that would be a when i talk about specificity those four scores in a row if you listen to them is a crash course in what i mean by it they're you know you couldn't take a single piece of music from any of those and put it in the other movie and have it work, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. And um, so we finally, I want to get to Dion Taylor, who's of course yeah. such a fantastic collaborator with you and you guys done traffic, the intruder, black and blue. And of course now uh, Fatal. Right. And uh, so talk about how you, how you met Dean and uh, what clicked and uh, yeah. what happened. What, how do you know, do you feel it? Like, is it mutual? Like, did you, when you meet a director that really connects and you go, this is somebody I can work with continuously. Totally. It, it, uh, absolutely. Um, okay. So I met him, we had a mutual friend in his editor, Melissa Kent, who was cutting traffic mm -hmm. and just happened to be t probably saying happy new year to her or something. And she said, Hey, you know what? I'm working with this director. You, you should meet because he loves your music for Disturbia. And I said, oh, sure, you know, I'll come and I'll come over. And I and I went in and um, so they they were just in the early stage of the edit. He showed me uh, maybe three or four scenes. Um, so they didn't have the whole movie even. And he told me what it was about. And I thought it was interesting. It's about human trafficking. It's a thriller. But, you know, it's within like a real scary sort of tragic thing that's actually happening to people right now today. Right. So that right, right, I thought right. was interesting um, because, you know, he, I don't, he wasn't trying to make a, you know, um, I, I don't know how you put it. He was trying to make a thriller within the, in the world of that because it was important to him. He knew, you know, that it was a relevant topic. Right. And, but of course, and, also, you know, you don't want to exploit it and turn it into like, you know. No, something. that's that's yeah, that's exactly. What, exactly what I'm trying to say. Right. right. The, the goal was really to shine some light on it. But at the same time, you know, you're, you're trying to tell a story that it's not a documentary. You're trying to tell a, right. you know, a story within yeah. that world that might make the viewer go home and go, what can I do to help? You know, which is exactly, exactly what I did. And in fact, you know, I did some. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh what so i watched i watched those scenes with him and then we started talking about music and what he likes and what he wanted the score to do and all that and it was pretty much instant like as soon as you hear dion talk i don't know if you've seen him in interviews or talked to him he's he's a, a, first off an enormous lover of cinema mm -hmm. but his, he's you know like his enthusiasm is contagious which I realize is like the wrong word to use for 2020. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like yeah. you get around him, you want to work with him. You want to be in a room with him because it's just like, it's inspiring. It's totally inspiring. Cause this is, this is a guy who had a career as a professional basketball player in Europe, finished that and said, I think I want to make a movie. And in exactly the same way that suburban Jeff at age 18 said, or 17, I guess when I went off to college, I want to somehow get into film music. Neither of us had a clear path. We didn't have friends who were mentors. We didn't know, you know, no one could usher us in. So we had to go like, I got to find a way in. Here's what I'm going to do. You know, put your little toenail through the door, see if you can wiggle the toe in, see if you can get your foot in and now you can open it. Right. So that's what, he, that's how he makes movies. He just went, I'm just going to start making them and see if I get good. Right. And the next thing you know, he got good, right? So yeah, he's, that's where he was. And you and you think about that, and you go like this: it's this, it's outside the studio system. He works independently, and then he sells the movies, you know, through distribution channels. So he really is self-contained the way he works. And there's something super appealing about that, like like rebelliousness and 
sort of fearlessness that, you know, it brings me back actually to being a teenager and saying, you know, there's no reason at all that I should have ever thought that I could succeed in the music industry, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to be a little bit fearless and so did he. So, and I think that actually is what made it click, whether we said that or not. Well, no, I know we didn't say it, but that's what I think was the, the spirit of that conversation. So then it was like, send me a movie. I just want to do it, you know? And then um, from then on, the collaboration was a little different because he would call me up and say, Hey, this is what I'm making next. Here's the script. Tell me what you think. So I'm involved much earlier in his filmmaking now. Um, So like I read the intruder and I thought, uh, well, first off, I thought it's a home invasion thriller. Wouldn't it be interesting if all the percussion were, you know, made out of pieces of homes, <laughs> you know? So I went to yeah. Home Depot, I built this cage, which it's not here anymore, but it was behind me. Um, and I dangled, you know, air vents and wood blocks and I had door hinges and door stops and that became the percussion. And, you know, it, that's another one of those things. I think if you listen to the score, you might not even know that's what you're hearing, but it is part of the spirit of the score. You know, the, the, the metal clanging is actually air vent or a metal sheeting or you know construction pieces you right, know yeah right i mean and like, and like instead of tubular bells i just bought pipes and cut them into sizes and they'd smack them you know so they're not actually pitched so you, you might not know it you'd hear it and you'd think oh it's it's a bell but it's meant really to be a doorbell it's meant to you know these are all of the kind of i guess concept ideas that i i come up with with him and because it's not you know, because we're sort of renegade filmmaking, you know, yeah. it's, it's gotta all be me, you know? So I just build it and I do it. And it's like a handmade score. And, and the same too with um, Fatal and, um, and I'm doing another one right now for him that he shot during quarantine, which is, I, I actually didn't even know he was making it until he finished. And he said, Hey, I made another movie. <laughs> I'm like, of course you did Dion, you know, cause he makes you know, two or three a year. <laughs> <laughs> so and so that came out of nowhere but i'm like yeah all right you know let's let's get into it and uh you know we have this way of working now it's he works so rapidly that you know it's he's he's always making another movie when we're finishing this one so you know I, i've got to send things to him on set until he's able to come back down and we have to you know it's not like the the usual routine where like mondays and fridays you have a meeting with your director or something <laughs> it's right, more like right. i gotta catch him when i can and then he comes over at the end when we're locking everything in um you know to get everything like tight for the dub but it, you know it's that's been a super fruitful collaboration i think i met him three years ago maybe four and i'm on my sixth movie with him. so know. you know it's he just crazy. goes you know it's it and they're all different me, it just gives me like this memory of like when i was in film school it just feels like you're back with your friends making movies and you don't have this 100%. crazy pressure from the outside world like is it, is it no. just feel like that do you have to like are you still because i'm sure he's, he has investors and stuff and you do you have yeah. pressure to like or do you get way less notes in this kind of environment because you're working directly um, with Dion, or is it more well, like yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, th there are less entities involved. It's literally me and yeah. Dion. So just yeah. like you're saying, it's like me and my buddy and, you know, we're making a movie. And, you know, I, the closest parallel to that musically is actually working on a movie with Hans or or the, or the Mordecai with Mark Ronson. It was like right. he brought a bunch of instruments in. We played. We You know, we did a lot of, you know, I, I, it's really exciting to feel like i'm back at my sort of teenage years you know where it was <laughs> yeah. like you know get home from school you don't realize how little pressure you actually have in your life at that point but you go i go upstairs <laughs> i put on the guitar amp and i've got six hours you know <laughs> to do nothing but play or you know or go make music with my friends or something like that and that was that is part of the spirit that gets i think captured in what you know what i do with dion it's sort of like that with David Kep, even though we're on different coasts, but you know, it's, these are, they, they become your friends, the people yeah. you were, you know, so it is like that. And, and with Dion, like you're saying, there isn't, there isn't really a studio pressure from the outside as he's making it. Um, I, I mean, black and blue was made as a studio film, but I, I didn't feel studio pressure. That's the only one that he right. had done in conjunction, um, you know, 
with uh, Sony, but it, but the other ones he makes them and then gets them distributed. But I don't. I mean, in in that case, I don't remember. There wasn't really pressure. It's really mostly just me and Dion, and um, notes don't feel like notes when you kind of do them together. Yeah, and, you know, I don't know. Like to, the, it feels yeah. like the process. It feels like the right. And... Yeah, it's, it's a collaboration <laughs> or something. Yeah, but right, but so... you're right. I mean, something like as soon as there's three hundred million dollars at stake for a pirates movie there's understandably a different you know way of working and and there you you do feel that you know you, you try to be immune to it but you're not and i mean sure jerry Bruckheimer comes in the room and he's not immune to it so you know right, he's right. gonna make a movie he wants people to watch it he wants which means it needs to be as good as it can be and if that meeting that he's taking right then is about music well you're in the hot seat and and you you owe him your best you know it's that simple and you know and obviously Yoakum feels that same type of pressure on Maleficent and, you know, some of it, you sort of thicken your skin and you sort of get used to it, but I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm immune to that. I, I definitely feel yeah. it. Definitely it's, an feel. Interest, it's an interesting uh, thing. Cause I t I've been talking kind of more recently with composer about this, this confidence and self doubt and like, cause I think oh, I your job requires a certain amount of confidence behind yourself, but, uh, and uh, to, you know, be able to sit there and present your music, which is a very vulnerable thing because you're writing this kind of alone by yourself and showing it to somebody for the first time. Um, yes. And it's part of you. But um, so have you had to wrestle with that? I mean, mm -hmm. or do you still wrestle with that in terms of totally. how do you how do you overcome self-doubt? Do you have a process? I, I, or do you... <laughs> I don't know if you noticed when you started talking about it. I just you hearing you talk about it made me nervous. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I do still wrestle with it. Um, yeah, I've wrestled with it constantly, and or imposter syndrome, or you know what I mean. Like, right, I, right. You know, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I think the truth of it is that it probably fuels me anyway, and that if I were to suddenly become immune to it, it honestly, I think it would make me a worse composer, yeah. um, because it, 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 you know. No, nothing inspires like a deadline right? but a close <laughs> second is is fear of failure you know it, it is inspiring and it, it does you know maybe that's not the, the the exact way that we like to be inspired but the truth is right. that that pressure does help it, you know it pushes you and you think you think about it and this isn't the kind of job that i do when i go to bed at night not thinking about it you know it's the, the wheels are always spinning um and that's I think that's normal. I, I mean, I'm, I'm I, now I want to interview you because I want to know what, what what the other composers are saying. Um, but you know, <laughs> but, but the truth is that I don't think it's ever going to go away from me. I think I'm always going to feel like, well, in the same way that when I when I walked into the when I walked into Berkeley as a 17 year old college student who had only played his instrument for three years, I was instantly in the bottom 2%. And that meant right. if I'm going to do anything, I have to outwork them. Because because if they work as hard as I do, I'm still going to be in the bottom 2%. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. By the time we're done with this. And, and I'm using that as a, as, a, as a metaphor. It means it's the same thing in Hollywood. You know, I always feel like I'm behind. I always feel like... Um, I, but I, but I always was behind. I was always the youngest guy in the room. I was always the least experienced musician. And da, 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 you know, that obviously not the case anymore. But, but I still feel that way. You know, and yeah, I still feel yeah. like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of. Well, I absolutely do not feel like I've made it in Hollywood. Let's put it that way. I feel I like guess, yeah. I've got a lot of work to do. I feel like I'm doing the work. So I'm happy about that, and I'm and I'm certainly proud of the work that I do, but you know, self doubt is a <laughs> it's just part of my process now. I think, yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know. And the other day I saw on a uh, on an internet forum someone used the phrase "fake it till you make it," and it sort of turned my stomach. Like I sort of thought, like I've heard the phrase before, I can't stand it, you know, because. I don't know how to really say this. I feel like I'm not faking it. I feel oh, like yeah, yeah. it's all effort. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. so, 
So it's absolutely true that when I got the call from David Kep to go like, hey, I'm thinking of putting you in touch with Mark Ronson to see if you guys might want to do this together. You know, here's what I'm thinking. I have this kind of idea for the score. I thought, I don't know how to do that. I didn't yeah. think I'm going to just say I know how to do it. I'm going to fake it. I said, I would like to meet Mark because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to learn something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. And then it was like, that, that's like the best thing that could have happened, you know, because there's no one on the planet that could have been a better co-writer on that movie. So I come away from that thinking that was a great experience because I, I did something with someone who showed me how to do something I didn't know how to do. So I didn't have to fake it, you know, and, yeah, and just yeah. like when I'm talking about, you should have left. I, I didn't want to write a Welsh score because all I could do is fake that, you know? So I said, I can, I can get Welsh instruments. I can use them to create a flavor, but no way do I want people to say Jeff Sinelli turns in the greatest Welsh horror score of all time. You know what I mean? So like it was, a, that just wouldn't make sense. If you wanted to write a Welsh horror score, you probably would do better with the Welsh composer, you know? So yeah. the, I, I guess, you know, I'm, that that idea translates i think to everything i do so if if there's something i don't know how to do i'm usually pretty open about it even with directors and they say oh we want we want a polka and i go okay i'm i'm gonna try <laughs> you know what i mean like I, so I, i'm not gonna sit here and fake that this is my 300th polka <laughs> you know so right. it's a little i don't know i i, I I'm a, I've gone off on a tangent as usual with you, Kyle. I'm sorry, but that, no, I, mean, I love to, that's why we I love talking with you, Jeff. We get into yeah. these <laughs> things. Yeah, but I, I, I remember. Uh, I just want to ask you because I we're rounding back to to, to pirates. Uh, mm. You graciously invited me to that session, and I was filming yeah. stuff for you. And uh, and yeah, I, I kept thinking. I mean, I mean, take us through that. You're 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 sitting there at this console. I think you had Alan next to you. Um, I think Bruce was next to you Bruce. and Nick was out there on the floor conducting and behind mm -hmm. you have Mitchell Lieb and like Kalen Frank and all the Disney execs and I think Jerry had just popped in right and you're and you're there trying to make sure your music comes to life uh, what is how is that a nerve-wracking experience at the recording stage or is that more of like you can tune everything out and just you're focusing on yeah. the music but when you have all those you know you have the execs behind you you have your producer popping your directors are sitting behind you is that nerve-wracking or is it more comforting having everybody there behind you um, I don't, I don't think of it as nerve wracking. I think I still have this experience when I walk onto a scoring stage or, or into the building at Abbey Road, for instance, you you walk mm -hmm. under that sign or something and it's, I sort I get sort of taken by the kind of awe and the wonder of just, just that they let me in the building is, you know, is it's, yeah. it's pretty exciting. And so, and then all of a sudden you feel like you're in the world series kind of, uh, you know, yeah. it really is, you know, you're at the, you're at the, you're at a place where there's, there's 80 or a hundred people in your orchestra that have all been playing for decades. So you're looking at like thousands actually of years of hard work, you know what I mean? And yeah. And after, yeah it's all in one room and there's you know it's super inspiring it, it forces me to rise up i guess you'd say like you mm -hmm. know to kind of rise up to the because it, it's i don't want to say it's a challenge the musicians are amazing you know it's not it, it's but it's a big day you know and, yeah. and so yeah you're right to say like if if jerry's there and you know and he might want to enact some changes or talk about something or you know Yoakum might want to say hey, what if we you know you, you might be doing some real like legit musical work even while an orchestra sitting there waiting for you you know you can I guess sometimes I'm aware of the fact that it's it, the clock's ticking and maybe that's a little bit nerve-wracking but usually those moments are more celebratory and you know it, it's still hard work because your, your job is to you know, the musicians are world class in those rooms, you know, and what that means is they can, they can play everything every which, every way possible, right, you know, right, and right. so the yeah. job actually is to, you know, produ producing that session means, you know, you can say, 
okay, I wish the flute sounded a little more hollow. And they know what you mean by that. And they change, they can affect their tone. And that's not because they made the wrong choice the first time they played it. It's because it's just a new, it's a new opinion or, or an attempt at trying something or something I'm trying to incrementally improve the performance of the music. And, you know, the, those, the best moments in those sessions are where you, where you as, as a composer slash producer in that role say something that allows the musicians to kind of meet you halfway to you know give them an idea and then they all want to contribute and they say oh i i know what you're trying to do what if we did this you know right because think of it like you know on every single string instrument if you move the bow a centimeter closer or further from the bridge it changes the tone so as soon as you have 60 players there's leeway wherever they're going to put that bow so for and that's just one little tiny aspect that you, that they and you have control over. Right. So you might work and you might go, you know what, you guys move it up. You do this, you do that, you do that, you know, and you're starting to like construct the performance in, in ways. And typically you don't have to say to a string player, move your bow closer or further from the bridge. That's a bit pedestrian, but you say to them, you know, I wish the violin line were brought out a little bit more. I wish the cellos were a little more tucked in and I wish the flute sounded more hollow. They know what to do, you know, and they'll try it. And then, in, and of course, having someone like Nick on the stand as a conductor is another set of great ears in the, in the room with the mics. I'm on the other side of the room after the microphones, which is where I like to be because it's one step closer to the, to the final, you know, product. Final, so final mix, yeah. Yeah, and Bruce Fowler, of course, is a genius orchestrator. So he's there. So as soon as you go, oh, I wish it were, I wish it felt thicker. He's like, okay, here's what we do. Da, 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 and then off we go. So I do like having, I like having the team there. Yeah, and I like yeah. having the filmmakers there. Um, you know, and especially on Christopher Robin, when everything was, had to be done so quickly, there was quite a lot of tuning on the stage you know, oh, if we did this and right in that moment, we could get more emotion. And, you know, and it's my job to figure out how to deliver that. Um, I, those are my favorite days. And I'll tell you, that's the main, the main thing that I miss during COVID because, you know, I'm, I'm writing music that won't be recorded for a while because I'm on some long-term projects. Then I'll be in front of an orchestra, but otherwise I've been, you know, I did worked on Dion's movie. I worked on David Kep's movie. And like I was saying before, those are all pretty self-contained you know it's me it's yeah, me in this yeah. room and then at some point i'll have a group but it'll be 10 strings it's not going to be a big orchestra so that's a different um way of working and frankly you know depending on the schedule and and what goes on with the pandemic they i might be recording musicians one at a time and assembling it you know yeah that's what i think composers have been time. doing yeah yep, so right. it's been a, it's been <laughs> literally one piece at a time <laughs> I know. I know Lauren. Lauren had to get to go through that with his dark materials and his recent projects yeah. too. So it's um it's a tricky situation. Um, but I do want to jump back to Fatal before we close up shop. Um, uh, you know, talk about working with on this film with Dion because it comes out. I think comes out today. I think people can right. It really comes out today. Um, so talk about what were the initial conversations and what were your goals with this score. Yeah. What did you end up doing, I guess? <laughs> yeah. Right. So so okay, with on this one. Um well it's a femme fatale movie, right? I mean I, I I the plot, I don't know, you probably can gather most of it from watching the trailer. There's a man who um has an affair with a woman who ends up using, you know, that as blackmail to basically sort of bind him to kind of uh, commit crimes on her behalf. And you know what I mean? And, right, and so, right. So she's bad news and he, he's bad news too. He made him, you know, he shouldn't have done that. You know, anyway, it's, so it's, there's a morality to the story that I think um, comes to play. And I think also because I, I remember the, you know, the era when basic instinct and fatal attraction and this this kind of the, it was a genre that was quite popular um, very much yeah yeah and i i think of the scores that get written for those which are very sort of i would say like darkly romantic right because yeah, there's yeah. a you know you're talking about well you're talking about infidelity which is destructive and you know Bad. There's, there's, but there's also a seductive sexual side to that right. story. Yeah, 
exactly that's right there's that and then it's it's wrapped up in a in a manipulation thriller right mm-hmm. i mean I, I suppose in the more modern context we have gone girl or you know I, there, i'm sure there's a there's quite a few um examples but for me i started to think about the instrumentation of those and like you know the goldsmith version of it was sometimes influenced a little jazzy and you know i'd hear like certain kind of harmonic language that was unique to the genre and that was exciting and then I thought about the piano which for me I don't actually write that much piano music and 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 when I do it's not typically doing melodic roles and it's not you know so I thought it would be pretty interesting if I if I went there you know because it might make it unique for for me but also it's in the genre and then I thought well we're turning a lot of things over on their heads here in the story there's a few surprises people won't be expecting so what can i do to the piano to make it you know so i started kind of twisting and manipulating it and imagining you know the the things i do to abuse the cello behind me what would i do if it were a piano (laughs) right so so now that became part of the sound of one of the first things i sent to dion that he latched on to was this sort of warbly piano that's been through some kind of weird tape machine kind of you know, abuse, torture. Um, and I thought that was interesting. And now I'm like, all right, now I'm getting somewhere. And and um, Hilary Swank plays a character called Quinlan. She's the manipulative um, character in the movie. And so, but she also has a really interesting backstory. Like she's she's gone off the deep end for a reason. And you might even find compassion for her when you learn what the reason is, despite that she's obviously a horrible person trying to abuse people um so that had that had this sort of darkness to it um and then i wrote a piece for that thinking of like when i say darkly romantic this is more just the darkness of the human spirit and what you can become if you've been through trauma even if the trauma is your fault you know what i mean so i'm I'm trying not to give away plot points but there you know it's it's deep it comes it kind of comes from within and so it's deep and that was more of a like a dark kind of cello melody that i wrote that maybe twists a little bit more than than uh, traditional music but it's played acoustically um and then she's you know the story gets more and more warped there's a scene where uh, Derek, who's Michael Ely's character, comes catches his wife in the middle of an affair, and the the um, music in the scene is actually, you know, his song, like the song that he and his wife shared together. It's actually being played, so it's like as a source music. So that's dark to begin with that that right. his wife would use that song to commit adultery to. <laughs> so that we took that song. It's a Keith Sweat song called "Make It Last Forever." And it, we took that song. In fact, actually, Keith's people sent me the, the stems of it so I could get into the bones of the song. And as the song goes on, it starts just as the song, but it starts to warp and slow down and change and, you know, morph into it kind of melts, you know. And in, in the way, I don't know if you're familiar with but, but I've, with um, Chop and Screw remixing, which is slowing a song down and, you know, um, it's a kind of a remixing technique that almost makes the voices like they don't sound like they're singing. They're slowed down so much. They almost sound like they're yeah, talking. Well, it's more conversation. Right. Well, I, is it similar to what like Hans did with Inception where they slowed down uh, Edith sure. Piaf? It wasn't, vo- it wasn't vocal, but it was taking like that and turning yeah. to the brom, 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 kind of turn. Yeah. It down. Kind of, but uh, but in that sense, he he stretched the piece out like you're saying to slow it down. But it wasn't necessarily like a remixed. Right. What right. I'm talking about is more like comes from DJ culture. You know, from okay. it's like a DJ thing to do. Um, and uh, I think it was DJ Screw was the guy that did it from um, Houston, which is where it got its name, mm-hmm. Chopped and Screwed. Anyway, so okay. so he did a Chopped and Screw version of it, which obviously you know again, it's it's that idea applied to this piece of music not not that i'm a chop and screw remixer but they, you know to take that idea apply it to that song have the song kind of melting down and then my score elements in with it as the scene progresses and i think it was an interesting way to kind of bridge the source music to score music gap and like it it's it starts on the radio or on the speakers in the room and becomes this 
sort of trippy underscore piece of music as Derek kind of goes through his darkness. So a lot of the, I guess, concept of what I was trying to do with the score was get it to feel dark and visceral and not nice because, you know, all these, all of these choices that people are making in the movie are choices we shouldn't make in, in our life. They're, right, they're right, poor choices right. and they, and they have huge impacts and they, you know, and they have consequences and, and, you know, that's what I think is cathartic about a movie like this. It's, you know, it's a story about the absolute extreme possible worst version of what can happen when you make a bad choice. Right. And so right. that's, that I think is interesting. So the score in that sense is sort of melts down. And those are some of the big elements that, you know, we, we did the, some of those evolved as I was writing the score, um, but the the piano kind of like taking the tradition, like a traditional uh, femme fatale score instrument and morphing it into something unique for this, I think was the first step to kind of cracking the code of the, of the score uh, for Dion. He loved it. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's a, yeah. I, that's such a fantastic process. I just, I, I, yeah. This is the first time I'm kind of hearing about it. So it's, um, uh because yeah my mind went to the it's inception so that's, that's a cool thing yeah <laughs> oh yeah yeah no it's cool and and i think because um I, we ended up getting the stems of the song which made it a lot more kind of uh, have a lot more control over it it's super interesting to do that stuff and and um yeah anyway i'm hoping you get a chance to see that you'll kind of pick up on that now that we talked about it i think for the audience they might not necessarily know what's going on which i think is good it's right. just just hopefully effectively doing the subtext of the story which is you're really watching a man decline in front of you you know and right. and go through this very visceral horrible moment of his life you know and and the music has to play really what's going on inside him not what's going on in the movie you know exactly. that's, that's when i think underscore you know can enhance a movie when you're not you know it's not a great big it's not like some great big tune or something it's you know what i mean it's a visceral right. it's an emotional gut punch i guess absolutely um well to to wrap things up uh, uh let's 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 i like to maybe ask you some just i'll call them like uh, you know dating site questions just some, let's, <laughs> let's know let's know jeff the person let's know jeff the oh man <laughs> oh boy i better get some so, tea <laughs> We'll start off with uh, something funny. Um, so I think I asked this to Lauren a while back, but what's your favorite all night, all night or power snack? So if you're up late finishing a queue or a deadline, three o'clock in the morning, what are you reaching for to power you through? Or you're just like fasting throughout the night? Interesting. You know what? It's um, Well, first off, the tea I just drank. I'm not a coffee drinker. I drink tea, but a lot of it. <laughs> so, <A> lot of <laughs> tea. <laughs> yeah. So, so I drink a lot. Of, um, let me see. It would be a power thing. I, I don't know. It's, what happens to me when I'm working actually is the opposite. I sort of, I sort of atrophy. <laughs> like I, you yeah, know, yeah, I, forget, yeah. I forget to eat. I forget. Um, but I think if I'm looking for just a power boost, oh man, apples. <laughs> I'm pretty healthy <laughs> these days. Um, you know, what I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, I'm a ch a little bit of a chocolate buff, so I do. Yeah. Eat sometimes but i don't have like you know that's that's probably my go-to or or now we have a lot because it's it's quarantine we're getting a lot of like food in bar form you know right, power right. bars <laughs> like that yeah. just in case we need to stockpile so that's another common one you know <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, let's uh outside the studio what's your what's your favorite dish what's your favorite food to Oof. oh boy what'll um, be your last meal <laughs> That's a good one. I make a wow. meat lasagna and it's on my mind because I'm probably going to make one for Christmas because I think we all have earned a lasagna this year in the house. Yeah. That might be one of them. I make it with ham hocks and everything. Anyway, um, <laughs> that one, that I like. Um, I also like sushi. Um, that's my, which that's I don't, my favorite. Yeah. Good. Yeah, we have a sugar fish near me that I like to eat at. Oh, um, perfect. It's easy, and, and so you don't have to think, and they bring you good food. Or there's a Nobu that I used to go to when I was still restauranting. <laughs> right, um, right. But yeah, I w I'm going to go with either sushi or lasagna. That's what I'm going with. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what, what's your favorite uh, alcoholic beverage? And if, if it's not, if you don't uh, drink alcohol, 
What do you? No, I know you're a tea uh, guy. Tea. <laughs> it's tea. <laughs> tea. Tea is your exactly. beverage. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about your favorite place you've traveled to? Ooh, I went to Italy for my honeymoon, um, and I absolutely adored it. Uh, uh, I've been Italy's a, a favorite. I only got to go once. Um, and then my my wife is from Hawaii. She has a lot of family in Hawaii, so I go there much more often. Um, mm -hmm. Those are my two fav two favorite places to go. Um, you know, when I go to I've been to England, but not to do much more than work. So you right, know, I've been right. to London, so so I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know London. I know the hotel and I know Abbey Road, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, it seems I, I'd certainly like to go there. Um, I'm gonna. I'm going with Italy. I'm going with Italy. Yeah, I, my wife and I went uh, last year, and uh, it was we went in January, so it was not crowded. We did Rome, uh, oh, Florence, yeah. and uh, yeah, Pompeii. We did. I mean, it was it was fantastic. Oh yeah, <laughs> I went to Pompeii when I was there. Yeah, we we went to Venice, and oh yeah, the whole Pompeii story fascinated me when I was a kid. Oh my god, anything with ruins. Like I, my next, I, we want to go to Greece because I want to check out the Greek. But just, just yeah, walking but, in like the Colosseum and. The, yeah. the forum i'm just like this is incredible like it is. standing in the history and it's like in the yep. middle of this bustling city now but it's like you have cars driving around the coliseum I'm like, it's <laughs> it's so wild isn't it and and <laughs> we've, did you see when you were in florence the statue of david which yeah until i saw it you know was was always a picture in a book and you go wow that's cool and then yeah. I walked into that building and you, you kind of come around that corner right, and, you, yeah, right? and it's down and it the hall like, <laughs> right exactly and and it, it was like then you suddenly get it you know like I'm not that I didn't get that it was a masterpiece from you know from reading about it but you stand in front of it and you just go like I, I had no idea how amazing that was actually going to be you know that was like like a powerful moment so yeah it's, and it's because i think they like put, from my remember they put like his unfinished ones along yes. the way so there's like just like a a torso and then you see like the david at the end and it's like wow <laughs> right it's it's also like it's, it's an extraordinary lesson in salesmanship as well on the way in because like they, it's so well presented but right <laughs> i mean there's no there's just no denying that it's it's super special so and I, and I miss the i miss the uh, the cappuccinos and i miss uh, the the gelato which is fantastic yep it's everywhere I know. yeah <laughs> definitely my favorite food place i've ever uh, yeah, visited 100%. yeah 100 percent. that's why I'm, that's why i said lasagna <laughs> <laughs> um well i, I think you know that's a, a good note to end on uh thanks so much i mean we've covered so much today again as we always do um yeah. i did want to thank you actually um uh, again for the Lone Ranger video because you provided the oh yeah the, the, which I think we just it's almost near four hundred thousand views it's such a popular video oh wow like, yeah. oh, I did, oh that's good I'm happy to hear it that is, it is yeah. people are commentating and loving it and thank you for providing yeah. the, uh, the the film mix of the of the track so we no, do of the, course. The, the isolated scorch version which people love too good no I'm happy to hear when I was in London to score Maleficent I um I called up Daniel Pemberton. Cause I never met yeah. him, but I like him in that lecture. And it, we had dinner together and he said the same thing. He's like, you know what? I, I've just, I've always wanted to meet you. And I'm like, no, 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 stop. I've always wanted to meet you. you know, and he goes, it, and he said it was because of the, uh, the, that scene in the Lone Ranger, which he, he also liked. And, and I know it almost took on a life of its own kind of just yeah, that scene, yeah. but with, you know, Quentin Tarantino po po pointed it out. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know that I know the film had a, a rough uh, yeah. opening, but I think I'm hoping people go back and discover it. And I think people are because I mean, four thousand so. people are, are are tuning into that breakdown of the scene. So <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. I didn't know that. That's good. I'll go. I'll make it four hundred thousand and one today. I'll go back. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, uh, thanks so much, and I hope of you course. have a, a great holiday with your family and yes. all the best. And stay safe and have a great new year. And hopefully, we'll get to do this in person next time. We're all yeah. vaccinated. <laughs> that would be nice. I'm looking forward to being vaccinated and going out for sushi. <laughs> yeah.